Madhvi, we can start the live streaming and just tell when it starts. So Rajan, you need to start, right? Yes, uh, yes in few seconds. Okay, so I think we are live now. Okay, uh, so we can start now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rajendra Dhaka, convener of this uh, seventh GBM of INIAS. On behalf of core committee, I would like to welcome all of you. And on behalf of INIAS family, I would like to welcome Professor Peter for accepting our invitation. So without taking too much time, I now uh, request Dr. Meher to take this exciting session forward. Uh, over to you, Meher. Thank you, Dr. Dhaka. Good morning, everybody, and a very good evening to our distinguished guest, Nobel laureate Professor Peter Charles Doherty, who is joining us from Melbourne. On behalf of Indian National Youth Academy of Sciences, I again welcome you all to the seventh annual general body meeting of the Academy. This annual GBM is being held online due to the ongoing pandemic. It is said that hard times create strong people and strong people create good times. Last two years were very crucial to the scientists and the academia in many ways. And we all have learned and are in process of learning from ongoing tough times. The scientists, technologists, and innovators are tirelessly working to understand and solve the mysteries of viruses and our immune system. Today, we are starting the annual GBM of NIAS with a truly essential lecture by a very distinguished scientist, Professor Peter Charles Doherty, and the title of his talk is The Killer Defense. He has been working in the field for almost 50 years. I understand that you all must be eagerly waiting for the lecture. So without much formalities and delay, I would request Dr. Chand Shekhar Sharma, Chair Inyas, and Associate Professor at Department of Chemical Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad, to formally welcome and introduce our distinguished guest, Professor Peter Charles Doherty. Dr. Chandra. Thanks, thanks to uh, Dr. Meher. So good morning, friends, and good afternoon to our plenary speaker who has joined us from Australia. Welcome to the first session of INIAS, seventh annual general body meeting. I'm sure you will agree that nothing could have been better than to meet in person for this meeting, as we all were eagerly waiting for. However, at the same time, I must say that this is all due to this virtual platform that today we are starting our GBM with a plenary speaker like Professor Peter Charles Doherty, a Nobel laureate. So I believe that it really could not have been better than this, even if we are unable to meet in person. To the ladies and gentlemen who are with us on YouTube, let me very briefly mention that INIAS, which stands for Indian National Young Academy of Sciences, was founded in 2015 by Indian National Science Academy. And it is the only recognized young scientist academy of India. As we stand today in 2022, we have 95 members and 33 alumni. And in this GBM, we shall induct 22 new members. INIAS works as an effective voice of Indian young scientists and also promotes science education and helps in building a scientific temperament in the country. We closely work with Global Young Academy and also our neighborhood countries, National Young Academies. With this little introduction of INIAS, without taking much time, I would like to introduce you formally with our today's plenary speaker, uh, Professor Peter Charles Doherty. It's indeed my great pleasure and honor to have Professor Peter Charles Doherty with us for this public lecture. Professor Peter is an Australian immunologist and pathologist and was born in 1940 in Brisbane. He received the Albert Lesker Award for Basic Medical Research in 1995, followed by the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine jointly with Rolf M. Nagel in 1996 for their discovery of how the body's immune system distinguished virus infected cells from the normal cells. Next year in 1997, he was named Austin of the Year. 
In the Australian Day Honours of 1997, he was named a Companion of the Order of Australia for his work with Jinker Nagel. He is also a National Trust Australian Living Treasure. In 2009, as a part of Queensland 150 celebrations, Doherty's immune system research was announced as one of the Q50 icons of the Queensland for its role as an iconic innovation and invention. Professor Peter Doherty is a fellow of several societies, including the fellow of the Royal Society, FRS, honorary fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and the elected fellow of the Austrian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. Professor Doherty has authored several books, including Sentinel Chickens, what words tell us about our health and the world, the knowledge of words, and a part memoir, The Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize, A Life in Science. In this current pandemic time, when we all are so much affected by the SARS coronavirus and our immunity is compromised, again, it is so timely and so important for all of us to listen from none other than Professor Doherty, who is going to talk on the killer defense. Professor Doherty, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk ab about my field. I'm, as, as was said, I've been in science a long time and I'm quite ancient. And uh, in fact, I describe myself as part of the living fossil record of immunology. Um, I'm no longer running a laboratory. I stopped that recently. And some of the data I'll show is though from a colleague at the University of Mel Melbourne, Catherine Kidzierska. So what I'm going to do is uh, take you a little on a tour of infection and immunity, the pandemic threats, and try to give you some understanding of how immune response works. And also to um, particularly the, the aspect of immunity that I spent my, most of my career working on, which are the killer T cells, the cells that get rid of virus infected cells and bring infections to a close. They don't necessarily stop us being infected, but they terminate the infection by, by removing the source of virus. I'll also say a little about uh, the Nobel Prize and, and what it was about. So let's get going and uh, I hope I can work out how to share slides properly. Here we are, it's my presentation. And um, now the run slideshow. Um, there we are, we're going. Okay, the killer defense. So I'm, I'm working in Melbourne uh, and uh, at the inst institute that's named after me, which is an institute that specialized in infection and immunity. It's unusual, uh, this, that's the building there. It's unusual in that it houses an academic department of microbiology and immunology, Australia's best at the University of Melbourne. It also handles, houses our state diagnostic virology and bacteriology laboratories, World Health Organization Influenza Center. And through the pandemic, we've been drawing together the academic and the diagnostics and the clinical, because the clinical uh, doctors who also work in the hospital and are caring for patients are also part of our program. So I've been hearing a lot about the whole range of infection and immunity, some of which I would not have normally encountered because we know about people doing diagnostic work and clinical work, but I've been hearing from my colleagues two, three times a week online on Zoom. And, and I, it's actually, after a very long time in science, I've got a better understanding of what actually goes on and, and what we face when we're faced with a pandemic situation. And I think we've all experienced that this pandemic has given us experiences we didn't expect. We, we underestimated many things, underestimated the economic toll, uh, the social toll. And though we, we thought about the disease, but not about the whole sociological context. Others are doing this, I hope, but I think for those of us who are more basic scientists, some of this has been something of a surprise. Now, humanity has lived with major infectious disease problems for a very long time. The, the 
One we, the first one that many of us know much about due to written history is, of course, events like the plague that happened in Europe from about the 14th century, the Black Death that came into England. This was a bacterial infection carried by fleas and, and uh, transmitted to humans and killed them, of course. And it killed one third to one half the population of cities. So if you think of what we've been experiencing with COVID, think how that must have seemed to the people at the time. This is six, 700 years ago. It's not that, that long ago in terms of the American experience. They had no understanding of what happens happening. They had no real understanding of infectious disease. They, they had the idea of a contagion, but they didn't know about microorganisms. They didn't know about viruses. And really that understanding didn't come along till the 19th century, till the mid 19th century. So really it's, less than 200 years that we've understood the nature of infection. And of course, it's over that period that we've developed this incredible scientific capacity and scientific potential with that increasing at great, uh, great speed since we understood the nature of DNA and molecular science came into the equation with Watson and Crick's work on the, on the double helix and then all that followed. So it's, I think it's interesting you realize just how recent our real understanding of any of this is and how different our experience is now to the experience then, because of course they attributed the infection to all sorts of causes, bad people, uh, bad, bad humors in the air, uh, the punishment of a, of a divine being and so forth. And we know now, of course, these things are caused by bacteria and viruses, and there's something we can do about them. Now, the, the experience of humanity being challenged by organisms that come out of nature, uh, the plague, the silithanthrasis came out of nature. It was a disease that was carried by rats and transmitted to humans by, by fleas. And we don't worry so much about those bacterial diseases as pandemic diseases. And the reason we don't worry about them so much is though we worry about problems like multi-drug resistant tuberculosis or drug resistant staphylococcal and so forth, streptococcal infections that happen in hospitals. But the reason we don't worry about them so much is that a bacterium is a single cell in its own right. And because of that, it has metabolic pathways and mechanisms that allow it to live that are very different from mechanisms in us. And as a consequence of that, we can make antibiotics that will selectively kill the bacteria and a wide range of bacteria, broad spectrum antibiotics, and they won't cause disease in us. Viruses are different though, because viruses are our most intimate parasites. These are organisms that are simply a little bit of nucleic acid with some protein and fat around it that get into our cells and multiply in our cells. And because they multiply in our cells and they take over a lot of our cell machinery, it, we can't in the main make broad spectrum antiviral drugs. And that is why over the last 50, 100 years or so, the major pandemic diseases we've worried about and that are of concern to us are viral infections. Because if you're going to make a drug against a virus, you often have to make a very specific drug against that class of viruses. And that's one thing that we're doing now for, for virus classes, but we haven't had these drugs. There hasn't been the economic incentive to make them. And of course, when you're talking about developing vaccines and drugs and so forth, it's not just a scientific and technological problem, it's an economic problem. Who's going to pay for it? Is it value for money? Uh, is it justified? So the situation now, since 1900, the population of our planet has increased, I think it's about fivefold. I think we had 1.6 billion people on the planet in 1800, and we've not now got about 8 billion. So the issue of viruses or bacteria transmitting to humans from other species has increased concurrently. Uh, as, as people have become more crowded, they've crowded into areas that were, that were 
formerly occupied by wildlife and so forth, where these infections will come from. We've seen more and more transfers of virus infections across into humans. Uh, the one we're familiar with, of course, is influenza, which can come initially from birds, particularly aquatic birds via chickens and all the rest of it. That's the pandemic virus we've thought about for a very long time. And we've lived with a very long time. And particularly since the 1918, 19 influenza pandemic, which killed more than 50 million people. So, and, and in a population that was about a third the size of today. So you see how different COVID is not that terrible in that sort of context. But of course, that context means we didn't know anything about the virus itself. We knew it was a virus infection. We didn't have any antiviral drugs. We do now have antiviral drugs against influenza. We didn't even isolate the influenza virus until 15 years after the end of the pandemic. And now we were making vaccine. We knew what the virus was with COVID within the month. As soon as the virus was isolated, which happened very quickly in Wuhan, the virus was sequenced. And as soon as that sequence was published, people started making vaccines. So the reality of the way we handle infections is totally transformed. The coronaviruses, we learnt in the year, two, just after the year 2000, in fact, that bats, which we hadn't previously suspected as major carriers of human disease, actually carry an enormous number of viruses that can potentially infect us. Before the year 2000, if someone had said, well, what's an infection that's carried in bats which will infect humans? We would have said rabies because we knew uh, biting bats in South America could transmit rabies to cattle and potentially to people. But we wouldn't have really named anything else. But in 2002, 2003, we had the first SARS epidemic in, in East Asia. About 8,000 people got infected and 800 people died. And that was tracked down to bats. And it was shown that bats that were being trapped and sold in live animal markets in China um, Chinese cultural practice, they catch, a, catch animals in the wild, they bring them into live animal markets, they sell them, for, sell them live for human consumption. And that, that live animal market is probably where COVID-2 came from, though we lack absolute proof. We do know COVID-1 came from there. We know that the virus jumped into a little animal called the Himalayan civet cat, an arboreal a tree dwelling animal, that was being sold in these markets, jumped into that species, then it jumped into probably some of the animal handlers in the market. And then it was Chinese New Year and it got sped right through China, uh, in, in, in East Asia, down into Singapore. Uh, the only uh, Western country it went into was Canada, it got to Toronto. But that was our first wake up call that these coronaviruses could be a big problem for us. We didn't take it that seriously. But since 2002-03, two other viruses from coronaviruses have all so crossed over into humans, and they both cause uh, severe disease. One is COVID-19, of course, which we're also familiar with. The other is the Middle Eastern respiratory syncytial virus, which probably goes from bats to camels to people and then transmits between camels. These are not zoonoses, if, for, uh, if you know that term. Zoonoses are, are diseases that spread normally from animals to us. These are viruses that jump from animals into us, but then they spread between us. And in fact, since 2000, five new coronaviruses have crossed into human beings. Before 2000, we knew of two coronaviruses. They caused colds and, and croup in little children, uh, two of them. Uh, they're called human coronaviruses. We'd known about them since the 1960s. They're the virus, one of those viruses, the virus corona is called after for the crown-like structure on its surface. But since 2000, so there were two before 2000, since 2000, we found five more. SARS, the two SARS viruses, the MERS virus, and two new common cold coronaviruses. So what's happening here? It's probably not the case that the virus is jumping more from bats into us. These viruses are jumping more into bats from us. Probably what's happening 
is basically increased prosperity, particularly in China, that these live animal markets and people flying now all over the planet in large numbers, what's probably happened is we've ramped up the whole transmission possibility. And basically, we're going to have to, have to be much more careful about how these live animal markets are handled, because I don't think China's going to abandon them. They're part of their culture and so forth. But I think they'll have to be much more closely inspected. And we are running more of a risk of these types of infections uh, uh, happening again. Now, I won't talk about it in this talk, but one of the things that's happening now uh, that will help us if we have more of these coronaviruses jump over, and we know there are a lot of them in bats that can potentially jump over, is there's a big effort now to develop antiviral drugs, drugs that will stop the infection. And we can make these for viruses, but they take time to make, and they're very specific. But there's, the drugs that are being made now, you may have heard of the term named Paxlovid, for instance, a protease inhibitor, they'll work against all coronaviruses. So if we make antiviral drugs against all the main categories of virus that threaten us, and the coronavirus is the one, another is the Hennepa viruses, you may have heard of Nipah and Hendra virus, different type of virus, we could make antiviral drugs against that group, Another is the phyloviruses, Ebola and Marburg. We've known about Ebola for a long time, but it's only more recently we've understood that it comes, very likely comes into us from bats. So one of the ways looking forward is not just to have vaccines and our vaccine technology has massively improved uh, since we've had to deal with COVID, but the other possibility is that we uh, develop antiviral drugs that are broad spectrum and will work, work right across a class of viruses, all the coronaviruses. We have them for influenza, all the influenza viruses that we can do with a few more. And you can never, of course, if you're doing drug treatment, use just one drug because the virus will mutate and, and you'll get drug resistant variants. This is true for HIV, which is AIDS, is of course an infection that's handled by drugs. We've never made a vaccine. The virus changes so much and changes within us and also gets into our genome. It's copied back into the genome that it's probably almost impossible to make a vaccine. Coronavirus is not. We've made vaccines. They're very good vaccines. The virus is ch changing faster than we expected. So that's blindsided us a bit. And we're learning an enormous amount of vac about vaccines, quite frankly, and about our limitations and strengths when it comes to this. So we're threatened by these things. We're doing a lot now to make things better in case we get another uh, outbreak and then a pandemic. If we could have handled the Wuhan outbreak, with specific antiviral drugs, we might have stopped it at source. So we need international cooperation. We need uh, people working together across the planet. We need the World Health Organization. And though, of course, there are tensions between different countries and military tensions, what we need in science, particularly this area of science, is global cooperation, openness, frankness, and, and sharing of information at the earliest possible date. So here's the coronaviruses. You've all seen pictures of them. They're in RNA viruses, the genetic materials, RNA, not DNA, as it is in us. It's uh, uh, viruses can use also RNA. Uh, they have uh, some genome in the middle. They have some proteins wrapped around the genes. And then on the surfaces, there's spike protein. And the spike protein is the target of all the vaccines. All the vaccines we've used in, in Western countries, at least, have targeted the spike proteins. There are some killed virus vaccines, conventional vaccines where you grow the virus up in cultures and so forth, then you kill it with something like formalin or beta propiolactone. That's a Sinovac vaccine from China, and that's your vaccine. So it, it has all the proteins that are at least in the virus in it, and maybe some of the proteins from the virus infect itself. Now, we, we've heard a lot about the spike, and, and basically it's nucleic acid, in the middle, which is the genetic information you, that, that allows the virus to replicate. This is what gets into our cells, makes new virus particles, new virus particles come out of our cells. And, but it has three proteins wrapped around it, and it also has some lipids, some fat. So the proteins are the spike, and it's particularly important because it binds to the receptor that gets it into the cell and allows the virus to get into the cell. But then it's wrapped in a protein called nuclear capsid. There's a membrane protein and an envelope protein. So the other proteins there, some of them are on the surface of the virus and could potentially be a target 
for antibodies, but we don't know if they do have a protective effect. The neutralizing antibodies, the ones we talk about, are all against the spike protein. So viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They get into cells. They multiply, they take off their coat when they get in the cells. They multiply, new virus particles are made and new virus particles come out. So there are two, two points at which the immune system can intervene. One is to stop the virus getting into the cell. Once the virus gets into the cell, the antibodies that circulate into our blood can't follow it. The antibodies can stop the virus getting into the cell, but they can't follow it into the cell. They're too big. Then the other thing is the immune T cells, which bump off the virus infected cells. And that's what most of this talk will be about. Now, with all these viruses and pathogens out there, with that, we have this capacity to respond to something that's brand new. And as far as we're concerned, COV-2 is brand new to all of us. It hadn't infected people so far as we know before uh, the end of 2019. To deal with that, we have, a, we have a complex and very sophisticated immune system. We are large, complex, multi-organ, multicellular systems, and we're trying to combat tiny single cell bacteria and even tinier viruses, which multiply with enormous speed. And because they multiply with enormous speed and they're dividing, they can also mutate and change with enormous speed. We can't do that, but we have this complicated and, and uh, really quite extraordinary immune system. It has its limitations, as we're finding. Now, it divides into two bits, innate immunity, which is the initial immune defense mechanism. Very, all sorts of toxic molecules produce, various things get activated and turned on. It's, it's really the danger signals go out to the immune system. We have to start responding. It, it's quite old in the evolutionary sense. And we share elements of our, our innate response with flute fly and very primitive organisms, even single cell organisms. But what we have specifically in the vertebrates is adaptive immunity. This is the immunity that's very specific, very specific for a particular infection, a particular pathogen, a particular protein. In evolutionary ter terms, it's young. It's only 400 million years old. First emerges in the bony fish. And, and we see it in all vertebrate species uh, that we see in reptiles and birds. We see a somewhat different type of organization, but it basically amounts to the same sort of thing uh, as we see in mammals. And all aspects of the adaptive immune system are mediated by the white blood cells or their secreted products. And uh, so the, the innate system, even the cell itself, when it's infected, will start to produce molecules we call interferons. So all cells, many cells can be part of the innate system, if you like. Adaptive though, is, the, is made from, it, it all comes from the white blood cells. The precursors are eventually, originally come from bone marrow. In the terms of the T cells, the killer cells I've been talking about, they're processed through an organ called the thymus where they differentiate, in order not to attack us. And then the B cells uh, are the ones that make the antibody. They're less, less kind of sophisticated in the sense of not attacking us, but they're kept, uh, kept from doing it, to, hopefully, by the T cell response. Now, all these adaptive immune response interactions work primarily, not exclusively, primarily by protein-protein interactions. The antibody molecules, their proteins that are secreted by cells called plasma cells, they're in what we call the B cell lineage. And they, these antibody molecules grab hold of the outside of a virus particle. You see the red there, that's a, that's a structural picture of the, nucle uh, of the neuraminidase protein on influenza virus. And basically the, the antibody would bind, it binds to what we call conformational determinants. Depends on how the protein is folded and, and uh, then attaches and can prevent infection or prevent the molecule from doing its job. Now, all the vaccines we have work via the, anti the antibody response principally, but not exclusively. Um, and they work particularly again, what, again, well against what we call systemic pathogens. These are, these are viruses that get into the blood and get around the body in the blood. Poliomyelitis, measles. Uh, the, these are viruses that get in via our oropharynx or via our gut. 
they don't cause much damage there. They get into the blood, they transfer around the body in the blood, and they're seeded out. In measles, they're seeded out to the skin. In polio, some of them can get into the brain, destroy nerve cells, and you can be paralyzed or killed by that. And uh, with measles, of course, you get the characteristic spots on your skin. Now, antibodies, when a virus doesn't change very much, as measles and polio don't, the, if you've got lots of antibodies in the blood, they can stop the infection very effectively. Same true of all the mosquito-borne infections. So vaccines work well there. Where they uh, have a greater problem is with viruses that largely infect the mucosal surfaces, surfaces of the lung or surfaces of the gut, and viruses that change a lot, like HIV AIDS. And here we have, we have our big challenge. SARS-CoV-2, the antibody molecule, blocks the binding site on the virus uh, spike protein. You can see that the purple is kind of the bright, uh, that binds to the ACE2 on the surface of the cell. Once those two things bind, the, the uh, spike changes and basically the virus is then enabled to get into the cell and cause infection and cause the production of new virus particles. So the whole job of the antibody molecule is to get between that purple bit and that green bit so that doesn't happen. It's a steric blocker, gets in there, stops that happening, and the virus is floating around. It's kind of lost, and it'll eventually get destroyed one, one way or another. Viruses have no way of moving themselves around. They're just, they're just passive. They're like dust particles. Antibodies are the same. They have no way of moving themselves around. And for the neutralization to, to happen of the virus coming in, the antibody molecule has to hit it before it hits that, um, that, that ACE2 molecule. Now, it's not too difficult to keep regional amounts of antibodies in the blood. The cells that produce the antibodies, the plasma cells, are sitting in the bone marrow. They're pumping out antibody and they can handle viruses in the blood. And SARS-CoV-2 does go in the blood and that's one way it gets stopped. But it's hard to keep much up here in the nose and stop that from happening. So with a vaccine, if you had an infection up here, maybe you get more localization of antibody formers. This is the lineages of the various viruses we've been talking about. They're all separate, Omicron, Gamma, Alpha, Lambda. They're not coming from a a one thing changing and then changing again so much. We can see variants. I mean, for instance, Omicron, we're seeing a BAT variant. But these are all changes in the spike protein, principally the mutations that are allowing the virus to infect better and maybe avoid the antibody response are all in the spike protein. So everything is focused on that uh, spike protein immunity. We get robust antibody responses with vaccines. They do very well. But of course, our vaccine is made against the original Wuhan virus. And we haven't deployed any vaccines yet against the variants. And it could be that a lot of the protection we're seeing with the current vaccines, when we get them very high levels with a second and then a third dose, is not so much the antibody response, but it's the T cell response that's coming from that spike protein, which is not changing at this speed, not changing as quickly. Um, I won't go on with that, but the, you can show we, we, one of the things that's happening now is using modern technology with all the resources that are around for studying COVID. We're doing enormously sophisticated studies of what's happening in the immune system, what's happening in the blood, what's happening with the antibody forming cells and T cells. We, we've never done anything on this scale before. We've never had the resources and we didn't have the technology until very recent. This is from Ali Elabedi's lab at Washington University at St. Louis, young Egyptian scientist who trained in the United States, fantastic researcher. Um, okay, so, so that's the antibody response. It's like, if you think of it in war terms, it's like a gas attack where you secrete all this stuff out, the antibodies float around in the blood, they'll get across into mucus, and sometimes those antibody-forming cells can localise in sites of virus infection. But with a vaccine, that won't happen because you need an infection to get that thing going. But the other part of it is the killer T cell response, the, the cells that actually destroy other cells and take them out. This is the response that get, can get rid of cancer cell. It keeps some cancers under control and it's the response that gets rid of virus infected cells. Here we see it, this, the green there's a killer T cell. It's gonna kill this virally modified cell 
And they said, that cell is destroyed. Uh, I won't go into the killer mechanism, we don't have time. Recognition is that the receptor, the T cell receptor, a two chain molecule on the surface of the killer T cell recognizes one of our transplant molecules that's expressing, is bound in its tip, a little bit of virus, a bit of peptide from one of the proteins, eight to 12 amino acids from any of the viral proteins on the cell surface. And that tells the killer T cell that the cell has changed and it should be destroyed as you saw there. So it's the signal to, to and the recognition event. Now, these transplant molecules on the surface of our cells, these are the ones that are recognized in graft rejection when you get a kidney and it's rejected. And, and we have enormous numbers of different variants of them, just as we have enormous variant, variation in these T cell receptors. And which means if you've got enormous variation in these transplant molecules and they're presenting bits of viral peptide, they can present peptides from any part of the virus that's multiplying in the cell. Now, the virus has 28 proteins. Our, our vaccines are made only against one of them, the spike protein on the surface, because we want to target that receptor binding domain. But the peptides that target the killer T cells can potentially be made by, by not only by the spike, and some are, and they're the ones we're getting primed up by vaccination, but they can be made out against peptides from any one of the other 27. So there's a tremendous potential there for the killer response, which of course, if someone's infected with the virus, they will develop memory, immunological memory to these uh, uh, in, those, in those cell compartments. But of course, we won't have it there just with vaccination. Now, there have been three Nobel Prizes around this whole thing of killer T cells, transplantation, and, and the effective phase of killer T cell responses. The first was to Benassar of Dosay and George Snell, who worked out the transplant system in various ways in humans and in, um, uh, and in animals, in mice. Then we, we uh, worked on this, uh, the killer T cell uh, cellular defense, so the bumping off of the virus infected cells. And then Jim Allison and Tezuka Honjo used these killer T cells, which can get into tumors and are turned off by the tumors that can be turned back on again by uh, giving a monoclonal antibody that hits the switch on the surface and they turn them back on. The great advantage of this, of course, is kill it, turning the T cells in the tumor back on is you don't have to worry about all that different specificity from different peptides and different transplantation molecules. All you're doing is turning the individual's own cells back on in the tumor, which can then wipe out the tumor. Uh, there was a lot of work done on tumor immunity, trying to identify the peptides and all the rest of it. Tremendous amount of work, which really didn't lead anywhere in the sense of making vaccines or therapies. Whereas this worked, simply using a switch and turning the on switch with an antibody that would actually allow those killer C cells to operate. Now, here we see it again, of course, this is the tip of the trans, that's the T cell receptor, that's the peptide. Here we see the transplant molecule. This is how the peptide binds into it. And so the T cell receptor sees that thing on the right. And it's like two surfaces interacting in effect. It, it's, we, we used to talk about lock and key. It's not really a lock and key, it's complementary surfaces. And, and basically what's been tremendously satisfactory and, and in my lifetime, where we had, knew none of this when we started out, and it's all been worked out by many, many researchers over the years, is to see it move from a, 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 a sort of study where we're drawing crude diagrams to a study where we're actually defining molecular interactions. Um, and, and as I said, here's, here's just the CD8, the class one, the, the, the killer T cells focus on. You can see there's these enormous number of alleles that uh, can potentially use, be used for the T cell to see. This makes it difficult to make T cell vaccines with peptides because ethnic populations may vary in, in the spectrum of those alleles. 
that are expressed and thus the actual peptides that will be used. When we made our discovery that won the Nobel Prize, this is how we were drawing that, that interaction. And you can see how crude that is. Broadly, what we discovered is that the T cell is focused onto the surface of a virus infected cell by the need to see what we called altered self and which was later, later defined as peptide MHC interactions. This was done in mouse experiments. It was a chance discovery I've written about. If you want to read about it, you can read uh, on the Nobel website because uh, all the Nobel uh, Prize speeches and so forth are up on the Nobel website. Um, we benefited greatly because there's been an enormous amount of work done by George Snell, the mouse breeder, who was defining the genetics of the transplant system. And we tapped right into that to do our mouse experiments that allowed us to come to the conclusion that T cells are focused onto virally modified transplant molecules. And that really was a revolutionary finding. Uh, we wrote a little theoretical article, this is way back in the 1970s, that said, we found what the major histocompatibility or transplantation system was for. Nobody knew it was what it was for. They knew it was important. They knew that grafts were rejected, organs were rejected, but why did we have it? There was all sort of speculation, but nobody knew. And our finding just explained why we have that transplant system. It's to present changes in our own cells to the immune system. It's about what we call surveillance of self immunological surveillance of self to identify cells which have been modified by infection or becoming cancerous so they can then become eliminated. And that's why we got the Nobel Prize for the discovery and for this, this theoretical argument about what this all meant. So we, we kind of did very well out of that because we made the discovery very early on. Then the, the story about the peptide, the T cell receptor, and the, the transplantation molecule itself, that came along about 10 years later as the technology improved, different groups did it and so forth. So the lesson is if you want to win a Nobel Prize, discover the basics right at the beginning and then other people will actually work on it. So here we go again, uh, Nobel Prize um, 1996, uh, that's me and that's Zinkenagel. Uh, physicists are always first up on the Nobel Prize because Alfred Nobel, who set these up, thought physicists were the smartest people on earth. And of course, as you know, if you know physicists, they do too. Uh, and then chemists, and then uh, um, medicine, literature, and economics. The Peace Prize is actually awarded in, Stock in Oslo by the Norwegian Parliament. This is awarded by the Nobel Foundation in, in Sweden. So now just to say a bit about experimentation. Be these T cell responses are all are directed as complexes of peptide and major histocompatibility complex. The, the immune response itself goes on in the lymph nodes, the glands in our neck or our armpit. If you vaccinated, the vaccine will go to the axillary lymph nodes in your armpit. That's when the immune response goes on. Cells multiply. They turn over about every six hours. And after about seven or eight days, you'll see the immune cells coming out, going around the body, doing their job of immune surveillance and getting rid of, say, virus-infected cells. Or you'll see the immune B cells coming out, localizing to tissue sites, differentiating to become plasma cells, pushing out antibody and, and giving us that protective response. So the antibodies, if they're a good enough fit, can stop us getting infected if they can meet up with the virus before the virus meets up with our cells. The T cells take time to turn on again, back to be killer cells again. They won't be there initially. And that's why with these vaccines, you can be vaccinated, especially as the viruses change. You can get an infection in the nose, but it will generally be of shorter duration because the T cells will turn on, eliminate that virus infected cell. And the quicker that happens, the better. Now I'm gonna skip some of this because I'm going on too long. As the T cells multiply, they differentiate, they turn on, they express all sorts of effector molecules, in this case, killer molecules that are involved in that killer response. But that's true of all these cells. Multiplication is associated with differentiation. Differentiation, they change, their epigenetic profiles change. And some of these cells will go on to be called what we call effector cells. They will be the plasma cells that make antibodies or they'll be the killer T cells that kill virus infected cells, terminally differentiated cells. Others of them will go on to become memory cells, which are changed epigenetically and can be recalled quickly 
to become effectors. And that's the basis of vaccination against these things. We can follow the clones. They're, 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 it's called clonal expansion because you have many clones defined by different T cell receptor pairs. And we can follow those through and we can actually follow the kinetics of a response through into old age. We know that T cell memory will last for the life of a lab mouse and so will B cell memory and up to 50 years in adults. Though it's very good to get boosters. And of course, with COVID, we're getting boosters of very short range, not so much to lock in that long-term memory, but to boost up the numbers of effectors and the numbers of antibody molecules and killer T cells. Uh, this is what a primary response looks like on top. Look, kicking off after, after about seven days, T cells come in here, they will bump off the virus infected cells and the mouse will get better. These mice were immunized and you can see that the response is now much bigger but it still takes about five days to get going. And that's why there's a big lag phase with that killer T cell response. That's why I think the vaccines are protecting us against severe disease because of this response, but they're not protecting us against the initial infection if it's changed a lot in that spike. Here you see it. The primary response, virus grows, eliminate virus. Secondary response, much bigger, quicker, virus grows, not so much virus. And basically the less virus grows there is, the less damage there is eventually, whether it's done by the virus or by the killer T cells, killing the virus infected cells and the better off you will be. Um, does it work in humans? Yes, yes, and I'll skip over it, but it does. We can show by correlative experiments that it's working in COVID, that we're getting large numbers of T cells. And this data is now coming through very quickly as we look at COVID patients and vaccinees uh, in, in great depth. This is work that's particularly done by my colleague, Catherine Kizerska, who worked with me early on, but now lead, uses these a large research group looking at the immune response in humans with these. Here's uh, a very dominant uh, response in the COVID response to COVID-2, the T cell response. It's to uh, a transplantation molecule we call, we call B7, and it's binding a peptide from one of the four proteins that's in the virus, not the spike, the nuclear protein. So that means that the only people who would have this response are people who've been infected, not vaccinated with the vaccines that vaccinate only against the spike protein. And in fact, uh, the, the, the antigen tests, the rapid antigen tests are actually all against the nuclear protein. Uh, they're detecting the nu nuclear protein. And, uh, uh, and uh, that means, of course, you're infected and you're not just vaccinated. Um, the memory lasts a long time and it can be recalled uh, over a long time. And we do know that giving two doses of vaccine will certainly protect a lot against severe disease, but it won't protect much against, uh, as, as the virus changes, doesn't protect much against the infection. Tremendously diverse use of T cell receptors as well. So very, and here we see uh, the killer T cell response to peptides from the spike protein, the vaccine. This is a vaccine response. You can see it's, 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 it's there. This is after actually, uh, after the second uh, vaccine shot. Um, after the third shot, it'll come up again a bit more. But after two shots, you can see that um, memory, those, these T cell memory populations coming up to a high level. So basically we've been learning an enormous amount about immunity from COVID-19. We've deployed techniques and strategies we weren't able to deploy before, they just weren't available. The resources have been there to do it. And we'll come out of this with a much better understanding about how vaccines works, how about the infection works. If you think about it, we've never before, for instance, taken adult human beings and given them two vaccines or even three shots of vaccines in short succession. It's not something we've done. And well, with COVID, we've been doing that. And we've got a surprising, the vaccines have been surprisingly resilient in the sense that while the, the part that the antibodies see has been changing very rapidly, we're still retaining this T cell component. And we've been underestimating that in vaccines. So it's changed a lot of the dialogue around vaccines for people who are thinking about these, that maybe we should be thinking more about stimulating that T cell side as well because it may be what's stopping us from getting very ill 
and dying from these infections. Uh, through this time, I've been talking with my colleagues and I've also been, uh, I've written a book about pandemics years back and I also wrote a book about the first year of the pandemic uh, that's been published. And I've been writing a series of articles, simplified explainers of what's happening, infection and immunity uh, for a lay audience. So they're up on our website, that's the Doherty Institute, and it's a series called Setting It Straight. I'm now up to nine, number 92, and I've still got a long way to go. They've been coming out every week. But if you want some background on what I've been talking about here, I think they are fairly readable. Some of them work better than others, but it will give you some background if this is not a familiar area to you and you're interested in it. So setting it straight is, is a series. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful meeting. was uh, a very interesting and inspiring lecture. Thanks, uh, Dr. Doherty. Now it's time for a short Q&A session. The audience, you all can ask the question directly by raising your hands on Zoom. You can also either type your questions in the Zoom chat box or through YouTube comments. We will convey your questions to Professor Doherty. And uh, during the lecture also we have got a few questions, so I will read out those. Anup Mahajan is asking, what makes bats so special that they carry several of these viruses? Yes, there's a, as you can imagine, there hasn't been a lot of money around or a lot of people researching the immune system in bats. There's a wonderful scientist called Lin Fa Wang, uh, who worked initially in Australia and now is in Singapore. And he's been studying intensively infections in bats, the viruses in bats, and the immune response of the bats. But it's all very new. And uh, we do know that there's something around the interferon pathways. We do know they can carry many of these viruses. And they're not damaging the bats, but they'll damage us. And so it's very obvious that the problem is the infection, of course, and that triggers all this damage. But it's also obvious that a lot of the disease, the disease we experience and why we die is caused by our host response. If we didn't have the host response, we would eventually likely die from the infection. But the response and the cells going into tissue and killing other cells and making all sorts of toxic molecules and causing inflammation and lots of other cells coming flooding into the lung, which is a very delicate organ. So when people get into hospital and they're in intensive care, a lot of the problem, it could be that the virus is persisting and the immune system hasn't handled it, but a lot of the problem is the immune system not working properly, trying to handle the infection and doing a lot of damage. So, so the, the actual treatment that the clinicians are using is trying to suppress it with anti-inflammatories like dexamethasone or anti-interleukin-6, which is much more sophisticated, but, but that often saves people's lives, people's lives. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's true of all in, infections, actually. A lot of the damage is the damage we, we actually put up there to try and get rid of the infection. I was also uh, reading somewhere that uh, we have around 350 trillion of pathogens inside us. So viruses yes, and have... bacteria, they're already there. Well, we have masses of bacteria in our gut, of course. About, I think it's about, is it half our stool sample is bacteria. And all, a lot of those bacteria are infected with viruses, but they're not viruses that infect us. There is one situation where a virus infecting a bacteria makes it pathogenic for us, and that's diphtheria. It's, it's due to a phage, a bacteria, bacterial virus. We also have a lot of viruses in us that we don't normally have a lot of problem with. We, we've, known it. we've known about a lot of these for a long time, but we also, with new sequencing techniques, we've had, found a whole lot more, and we don't really know much about them, and people are just starting to uh, study them. So, uh, but the ones we know about, a lot of the herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes simplex that causes cold sore, these are viruses that hide up in our nerve cells and come back down again if we suffer some sort of insult. I mean, cold sores. I mean, the herpes simplex virus goes latent in your trigeminal ganglion, which innervates the lip. You get a sunburn, that sends a signal up to the 
to the uh, nerve body, and then that virus comes back down into your lip and you get a cold sore. Uh, shingles is the same sort of thing. So lots of viruses in us. And, uh, and we're, if you think about it, we're a kind of planet. You know, we're, we're populated by all these different species in different ways. And uh, we're, we're, in, we're a series of micro environments. We're, 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 um, I, I tend to think of, of infection in that way. Thank you. And Partha Devnath is also uh, asking that, is SARS-CoV-2 show any tropism? Tropism? Just, yeah, it, tropism. It, it, goes, it, it goes into any cell that has ACE2 on it. Mm -hmm. It can also at times get into cells that don't have ACE2 that are strictly adjacent, we think. <laughs> but the main means of, of getting around, the, getting infecting other cells in the body or infecting other cells in other people when we cough and splutter the stuff out is by binding to ACE2. So anything that has ACE2. But then it's not just that, of course, it has to gain access. So, for instance, the blood brain barrier, there's not a lot of evidence that the virus is getting into the brain, for instance, causing problems. But we have brain problems because the immune system, you know, you know when we, we, we get an infection, some of these molecules that are made, like interleukin-6 and interleukin-1, these are secreted by the cells and they're trying to get rid of the virus or do various things or promote inflammation. They, they get into our blood in large concentrations. And, and when they're in the blood, they interact with receptors in the brain. So the reason we get a fever is because of those molecules. Now, fever, of course, and headaches and muscle pain, um, very unpleasant, but really you could say they're nature's way of telling us to slow down. If you've got those, uh, those the fever, don't go out and jog to try and get rid of it because that'll, by increasing your blood supply and pumping a lot more blood around, there's more chance you'll get that virus in places you don't want it. So, uh, so basically take, and when you get an infection, take heed of your body signs because you know, this is part of what protects us actually. Great. Um, Mirnmaya Ghosh is asking, how will these variants alter vaccine-related protection and the successful treatment? What will be the long-term impact of these viruses on our world? We, we, we don't know, honestly, what's going to happen. We'd like to think that Omicron will be, you know, it seems to be a bit milder. That's because a lot of us have either been infected or we're immune due to vaccine. And it does, it is milder and it's not putting as many people in hospital or killing as many people. Though the vulnerable elderly are still dying. I mean, people, when they are very frail and very old, their immune systems just don't work very well. And, and, and I, it's very hard to protect them. Same is true of influenza. Though, of course, many, many, many more have died of COVID. And so, um, so basically what will happen next? We don't know. We don't know whether another new variant is going to come along or whether it's all going to sort of calm down and, the, and we'll, though we'll have a recurrent problem with this and maybe we'll have to start making new vaccines every year to deal with variants, uh, we, don't, we don't know what's going to happen. The best bet for us, though, is to really drive on with making those antiviral drugs because if we make antiviral drugs, we can at least have treatments because what could happen? Say we had a drug out there which was readily available and cheap that you could use to treat this thing. And that's not an impossibility. We, could, we should be able to do it. We do it for AIDS. I mean, an enormous amount of AIDS drugs are made in India and they're distributed all through Africa and everywhere. You've got the great uh, generic drug production uh, facility for the world, quite frankly. I mean, you do an enormous service. So if we could do that with COVID, for instance, we could, uh, you could go along and get your test. You could have one of these antigen tests, a rapid antigen test you could do yourself, or you could go along and do a PCR test. As soon as you tested positive, then uh, what you'd have is a, a drone or a, or a fast food delivery guy bringing you a packet of 10 pills, which you would then take for the next five days. And that would, would deal with the problem. But we need more than one drug in that. Otherwise, we'll get uh, drug resistant variants. So I think that's got to be the future of a lot of this. We need vaccines because they're, they're cheap. We can get them out there. We can get them to large numbers of people. And they're a protective mechanism. But we need the drugs as well. We need both. Okay. So and we can have the drugs ahead of knowing the variant. All we need to know is it's a coronavirus. Dr. Nishant is asking, uh, can you please help us understand what might have caused the low severity of disease uh, with the COVID uh, Omicron variant? 
And what is our expectation with the new variants? Well, again, we don't know really. I think Omicron is not that avirulent. It, it is, it's about 70% as bad as Delta, in fact. But I think it's because so many people are immune or partially immune due to vaccines or, um, or, or having had the infection. We're not sure, but that's what we're thinking. Now, we don't know whether, uh, we, we, we had thought at the beginning that it would be like influenza. Very severe to begin with, then we get a slightly milder form. That's what happened in 1918-19, when we had none of the tools we have today, and many, many more people died. But the whole thing was over in about 18 months to two years, and the virus just mutated, and it was less virulent, and people were kind of protected, I think, probably by the T cells, actually, and, uh, and so forth. But will that happen with, um, with, with COVID? We're not sure. And uh, it surprised us all the time. What's really surprised me, I'm not a virologist, I'm an immunologist, so I've worked with viruses a long time, is how many variants have come through. So, uh, but we, we, this was the first time in, in the history of modern science when we had any sort of technology that we've dealt with a respiratory pandemic, which is what we call virgin soil. That is nobody on the planet had much in the way of pre-existing immunity. There's a little bit of T-cell immunity from some of the common cold viruses, but there was, but basically it's what we call a virgin soil pandemic. Now, of course, we're not virgins anymore. If uh, another big coronavirus comes along, we'll have some more cross-reactive immunity than we had, and we'll know much more how to handle it. Thank you so much, Professor Doherty. Uh, we are running off out of time. If you permit, we can ask one or two questions more. Yeah, sure, if you want, yeah. So Mehak is asking, uh, could you comment if there is a relationship between cytokine storm observed in certain individuals with COVID infection and HLA haplotype, or if it is just due to dysfunctional regulatory T cells? I, I'm not sure of the answer to that. It's a good question. Obviously, uh, your question knows quite a bit about immunology, and uh, I don't know whether it's HLA related uh, and... Um, can't think that it is, but I don't think, I, I think actually we don't know. But the cytokine storm, storm effect, uh, is, it's not quite like the early cytokine storm you can get with some influenza viruses. It's a late event. Uh, and that's uh, excess cytokine production is causing, can be causing a lot of the problems in, uh, in severely uh, ill people. And that's why they're using uh, blockers to some of the cytokines, interleukin-6 or interleukin-1. Very expensive though, the monoclonal antibody is very expensive therapy. So Sandeep Paul is asking, it would be great if you comment on the gut health and it's any correlation with vaccine effectiveness. Yes, yes, a very good question. Uh, the whole microbiome uh, study thing has become a very, very big area of research. And some of our people are trying to do it. It's enormously difficult research to do well because uh, you've, got, you've got so many variables. But, but basically, I, I think it's very likely there may be correlates, but we don't, we, we don't really know. But uh, we have a, um, one of our programs at, uh, at the Institute, for instance, um, uh, um, uh, Dale Godfrey is actually, uh, Sammy Bedoui is actually looking at it. Uh, from the point of view of how this influences or trying to look at it, for, uh, how it influences the vaccine response, which is more easily to easily controlled from the point of view of studying it. And Nima is asking, do you think that COVID, uh, a SARS-CoV-2 evolution is a selection driven or a random mutation process? Uh, that, that, again, is a good question. I, I mean, Omicron, Omicron looks a bit more like an immune escape mutant, uh, which is what we see with flu, the immune escape mutants come through. Um, it does look more like that to me. I think Delta wasn't probably. I think Delta, it emerged in India back in, the, towards the end of 2020, as I recall, and I don't think there was a whole lot of vaccine out in India there. And I'm not sure that, not sure how many people you had infected, but I think, Delta was just a mutant that grew better. And, and it grew, because it grows better and grows faster, it transmits better. Now, Omicron actually doesn't grow better than Delta, but it still transmits more. So it's interesting. I, I think maybe there may be a, an element of immune escape, but, but it's not actually clear. Okay. Last question. Jeevan is asking, uh, many viruses, including COVID-19, gain entry into the brain. 
how these viruses are capable of breaching the blood-brain barrier? Yes, there, there, there are two ways that viruses get into the brain. Basically, they can either grow through uh, the, the endothelial cells and the blood vessels or through the ependymal cells and through the cerebrospinal fluid and so forth. It's not clear a lot of SARS-CoV-2 getting in the brain. The other way they can get into the brain is, is via, we know that one of the first symptoms of COVID can be you lose your sense of smell. So the virus gets in, so the sense of smell, these are in, these are, the sensors are nerve cells with processes that go up into the brain. They, they, they're up in the top of the nose and they go through into the brain through a, a bony plate at the top of the nose called the cribriform plate, which has lots of holes in it, but allow these nerve fibers to go through. So if that virus can go along the nerve fiber, if it's infecting those nerve cells, it can get into the brain, into what we call the olfactory bulb. And so we don't know whether that's happening. We think a lot of the sense of loss of sense of smells not due to the nerve cells themselves being infected, but it's due to the supporting cells around them. They're called sustentacular cells. But I haven't seen any clarification of that. So we, it's very confusing. The brain symptoms of this are considerable, especially in long COVID, which is a really distressing problem uh, where you're getting this chronic debility. Uh, but it's not really clear what's happening in brain. Not a lot of brain is coming to postmortem, for instance. That's part of the problem because people don't do postmortems the way they used to so much. They use imaging a lot more. Uh, but it would be good to look at a lot more brain. Thank you so much. And uh, the last question again, the, uh, Rajendra Dhaka is asking that, what about the cocktail of vaccines? How, I mean, how would you comment on that? Well, at the moment, we're just using the one vaccine, the, the one... Uh, in where we're using mRNA or adenovirus vector vaccine, which are the vaccines that have been used in Australia, the United States. There's now a protein vaccine, Novavax, which is against the, um, uh, the, the, the spike protein only. Um, we haven't tried cocktails yet. Um, and in fact, we're doing the experiments. The experiment's just been done. I mean, they're making an Omicron vaccine. Pfizer is giving it to... Um, people who've been double vaccinated. Now, we may be running into a problem here that we don't really have time to go into, but it's a problem we've known about for a long time in immunity, and we've talked about, it's called original antigenic sin. It's that the virus, the, the vaccine, though it's against a variant, may tend to actually tend to promote the response that's most cross-reactive rather than the new response. We've got a naive response, which is to the new bits, going on at the same time as a memory response to the bits that are shared. This may get in the way. And uh, again, this, uh, the COVID experience will tell us a lot about what's going on in that respect in humans. Thank you, Professor Dohati. It was really an interesting session. At last, on behalf of the whole INYAS family, I formally thank you for kindly accepting our invitation on a very short notice, I must mention, and taking out your precious time to deliver such a scintillating lecture and uh, this uh, nice uh, Q&A session. If we talk about India, we are a country of youth. Professor Doherty, it will surely inspire us to take up more challenging scientific problems and even tackle them more creatively. Thank right. you so much again. We're looking to you to solve climate change, which is the big problem. So thank you. Have, so uh, on, Professor Peter, we have a uh, Dr. Meher, we have a memento for. Yeah, sure. No. Uh, photo. Okay. So uh, thank you, uh, Professor Doherty, for this wonderful okay. lecture. And, thank you. Uh, and uh, this is just uh, a small memento for you. Uh, this is a book, uh, demystifying the nature. Uh, written by uh, two of our members, including one, myself and uh, another member, Dr. Mudrika Khandalwal, Demystifying the Nature. So this book is basically talking about the various uh, attractions in the nature. And we have taken uh, five examples and we have shown uh, using the illustrations that uh, what, how, how the exotic properties are shown by the nature. And in terms of its structural properties, we can simplify these things for the students. So this is a uh, book for you. We will, we will dispatch it for you. Thank you very much. And thank you and have a, have a great meeting.
Thank you, Professor Doherty. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. So lastly, uh, on behalf of INIAS family, I also thank audience who joined us through Zoom and YouTube. Thanks a lot to the technical team and also the other team members at the background. And finally, now it's time to conclude the session. I again, thank you everybody and goodbye. And please let's join at uh, 150 uh, for the inaugural session. I request everyone to join the inaugural session at 1.50 p.m. Thank you. Thanks, Meher. Thank you. Thank you, Meher. Thank you all. Bye-bye.